Welcome to the 2011 First Robotics Competition and this year's game, Logo Motion. Logo Motion is played on a 27 by 54 foot field. Alliances of three teams each operate their robots from behind alliance walls at the ends of the field. Four towers are located near the middle of the field at the ends of designated lanes extending from each corner. Two 3x3 three three arrays of scoring pegs form the scoring grids located in front of each alliance wall. Robots play logo motion with inflated tubes shaped as elements of the first logo. The objective is to place the shapes on the scoring rack to create the logo. Robots can use their cameras to follow lines on the floor or to track the vision targets placed on each scoring rack. This allows them to target scoring locations from almost anywhere on the field. Before the match, each robot is placed behind the towers on their side of the field. Each robot begins the match with a yellow Uber tube. The match starts with a 15 second autonomous period during which robots try to place the Uber tubes on the scoring rack. Each tube placed during this period earns bonus points. At the end of the autonomous period, human drivers step forward to take the controls. During this teleoperated period, teams control their robots and attempt to place the game pieces on the scoring rack. Game pieces can be placed anywhere, but are worth more if they create the first logo. Human players at the corners of the field put game pieces into play. Robots can only possess one game piece at a time, so they must drive the length of the field to score with each new game piece. Robots will try to make it into their alliance zone as they attempt to score. Opponents are not allowed to enter this zone and cannot interfere while robots are placing game pieces. Each game piece placed on the scoring rack is worth one, two, or three points. This value is doubled if the game piece covers an Uber tube. Each completed logo earns a 2x bonus for that row of game pieces. Near the end of the match, robots drive to the towers and deploy minibots on the tower poles. As the end game starts, minibots race to the top of the towers. The first minibot to the top earns a 30 point bonus. Second place earns 20, third place earns 15, and fourth place earns 10 points. Good luck, and we'll see you at the competitions. Thanks, Dave. Great job as usual. Let's take a look at the real thing. Okay, so Dean, where would you like to start? Let's look at the game pieces. They're great. They aren't easy to toss. They don't roll very well. They go every which way. Looks like uh, human players are going to have to make some careful decisions about how they retrieve and place the game pieces. Once they're on the carpet, they're all fair game. There are a lot of uh, sharp objects out there as well. What happens with a deflated game piece once they're busted? They stay in play and they won't be replaced until after the match. Okay, it's time to move on to the retro reflectors. They could be useful for targeting. Sure, and the teams can add illumination to their camera. Look, this beam is wider than what the lens can see. And here's how it looks straight on or at an angle. There is a lot of tape on the field this year. And it's all useful. The red and the blue tape indicate the lanes and the zones. The yellow is a caution line to help operators stay clear of the zones. It's a significant penalty if they encroach. And this lane barrier will help keep robots from straying between the lanes and the zones. That's a violation. Don't trip. We're using gray tape for trackers. Did he say trackers? I sure did. Check out these sensors. This is great stuff. FLL teams have been good at this for a long time. That's right, and these sensors really are industrial grade. A robot can follow this line, or it can be programmed to follow either branch of the Y. Is that stuff actually in the kit? The hardware is, and all the software is on the first website. The kit is really special this year, and no one knows more about it than game design committee member Kate Pilot. Kate? Thanks, Dean. Let's go over a few really important facts and features of the 2011 kit that Colin Fultz and I have been working on. In just a few minutes, you'll get your kit. We need you to go through it really carefully to be sure you have everything and it's in good shape. Do it soon. The deadline for reporting missing or damaged items is Wednesday at 8 p.m. After that, I'm afraid you're on your own. 
The process for reporting missing or damaged parts is posted on the Kit of Parts website. More on that in a minute. As you inventory your kit, veterans will notice some new stuff. Veterans will get an 8 gig USB stick to image the 2010 netbook, and rookies will get one for the 2011 model. Make sure you get the right key for your rookie veteran status. The disc images are different because the hardware is different. If you're a veteran team and have purchased a new netbook, please email us and we'll get you squared away with the image you need. Everyone must re-image their netbook and update to the 2011 software for their control system to work. Rockwell Automation has continued to be very generous and donated the line tracking sensors you've seen demonstrated. Each team gets three and we'll be excited to see you put them to work in Autonomous. In addition to these sensors, You'll also find a few other new items, including kits of bearings, shaft collars, sprockets and belts, linear encoders, retro-reflective material samples, and a kit of four BaneBots motors. A special note about the BaneBots motors. Make sure you review the manual for information about how many you can use. A comprehensive checklist of the items this year is available on the Kit of Parts website, which I'm getting to. The biggest change this year is the new program called First Choice. It's an online extension of the kit and enables us to make a wider variety of donated parts available to you. It's our intent to migrate much of the kit of parts to an online model so that the process can be scalable as FRC continues to grow. First Choice is an online repository of materials. You just have to pay for the shipping. Now there are limits on how many parts a team can request and a deadline. Teams must make their parts selections by January 16th. For details, please read the information published on the kit of parts website. Still getting to that. I just want to take this opportunity to thank the team at Andy Mark for everything they've done to make First Choice a reality. Not only has Andy Mark agreed to manage all the logistics for First Choice, but they also know Dean's favorite word. Without that kind of support, First wouldn't be able to try different ideas like First Choice. We want you to know that about 80% of what's in your kit was donated by a family of generous suppliers. They help us get parts to you to help you build your robot, but they also help keep your costs down. There are 66 different suppliers this year. Many have employees who are mentors and volunteers. When you meet them at events, please thank them for their gifts. Now, I've covered a lot in the last few minutes, but don't worry. All of this information, including this video, is posted on the new Kit of Parts website. I promised I would get to it. Here it is. You'll find a one-stop shop for information you need about this year's kit. If you still have questions, check the first forms. The answers are probably already there, and if not, just post. Good luck. Thanks, Kate. Great stuff. Let's see what we can do with it. Well, for one thing, you could come up with something very tall, but it still needs to fit inside this envelope at the start of the match. That thing is flying. And everything except the bumpers and the black cover comes straight out of the kit. It's come a long way in 20 years. And it can be really heavy up to 120 pounds in the bumpers and the battery, plus a 15-pound minibot. It's still very fast and looks really maneuverable, even fully loaded. Be sure you think about where you put that weight. You can do all sorts of precision maneuvering in the protected zones, but be ready for big hits out in the open field. Are we using bumpers this year? I didn't put them in the animation. Do we actually have to use them? They are required. The rules are strict, and they are really important, especially if you want to be playing on Saturday afternoon. And I hope the teams understand the pinning rule clearly. It's simple, but very important. A robot may not pin another robot that is in contact with the field border or the tower for more than five seconds. Yeah, and it's huge this year. Ten times more than any other penalty. I hope we never see it. The minibots sound like a lot of fun, but how do they get to the pole? Well, the teams are going to need to be sure to allow for that. Remember, even if you don't use your own minibot, you still want to be able to deploy one. Here's a deployment device that slides out on drawer slides. You can get them at any home improvement store. Oops, we jumped the gun a little bit. You can't cross into the cylinder until the 10 second mark. If you do, your tower is disabled and you're out of the race. At this competition, do whatever is necessary to be sure you don't leave too soon. 
So let's reset. With 15 seconds left, the base lights and the lights at the top of the pole will flash. They will stop flashing at 10 seconds. The base lights will stay static until you've reached the top. You'll be able to tell how you did by counting the strobes on top. The first minibot to the top lights them all. Here's another that swings out using the exact same minibot. If it does not come down on its own, the field personnel do whatever is necessary to keep things moving along at your peril. And here's another way to go about it. Thanks, guys. Great tour. I'm really excited about all the options this year. I know that you all are really raring to go, and we need to get started on the 2015 game. We'll be here for a bit, taking some of the great questions that you've been tweeting this morning. Over to you, Blair.